good to have you back. I'd like to talk to you in this video clip about complex numbers. Now I get a lot of questions from my students about complex numbers and it's pretty clear to me that not all of them are comfortable with the idea of complex numbers. Maybe you're not either. Well maybe I can help. I'm going to start by just writing down a complex number. There, 3 plus 4i. Now you notice I got it assigned to z, and a lot of, a lot of times you'll see z being re uh, reserved for complex numbers. There's even something called a z-transform that's a mathematical operation that involves complex numbers. Well, this is the real part here, and that's the imaginary part. Now, first thing, these are the worst names ever for those two mathematical entities. When I become king of the world, one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to rename those as something else. Uh, red and blue, left and right, up and down, chocolate and vanilla, anything but real and imaginary. I hate these terms, but they've been around long enough, we're stuck with them. The, they make you think, because it's called real and imaginary, it makes you think that somehow that number right there is more legitimate, somehow more mathematically valid than this one is. This is somehow not a legitimate mathematical entity or not a valid uh, a way of expressing a mathematical idea. It is. It's fine. There's nothing bogus, magical, anything about this. It's just a number. It's a slightly different kind of number than that one, but it's just a number. All right. So don't let the, the names real and imaginary fool you. Imaginary is just a badly chosen name. Right? Now that I there is what makes, that's the important part. Everything revolves around that. So I is just the square root of minus 1. Well, there's no simpler way to write this. You can't write this out in, in some other form that's more compact than this. When mathematicians see things enough times, they eventually give it a name. And so instead of carrying uh, square root of minus 1 around through equations a lot, they just called it I, okay? I for imaginary, I assume. Or, now the electrical engineers have a slightly different twist on this. They call j the square root of minus 1. The reason they do that is that they use i for current. Well, there's only 26 letters in the alphabet. You're going to have to recycle some of them. So they didn't want to uh, reassign current as something else. They wanted to keep current as i. So they use j as the square root of minus 1. So in some technical works, you'll see i. Sometimes you'll see j. Some textbooks use j. That's OK. Don't worry about that. j and i are interchangeable in that sense. OK. Well, here's the deal. So here's this complex number. There's a real part and an imaginary part. The combination of a real part and an imaginary part make a complex number, not a simple number. Okay? Now, there's no more uh, compact way to write out this. There's a real part and an imaginary part. There's no way to condense it any further than that. These two entities are unique. One can't be expressed in terms of the other one. Okay? And that's a big idea. What that means is, that in mathematical terms, you can think of this as the two being orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. And if that's the case, you can draw a picture of it. Well, I don't know about you. I'm a lot happier when I'm drawing pictures of things. It helps me understand better. I'm a, I must be one of those visual thinkers. Four and one, two, three, four. That's close enough. So here's a, here's a set of axes with real there and imaginary there. Okay, along those. So this is just like x and y, only now it's real and imaginary. Since the real part and the imaginary part are, are separate entities and one can't be expressed in terms of the other one, they're, they're orthogonal and I can plot them out like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, that point right there in space is 3 plus 4i. Now that makes sense. You know, I'm standing here in my little office, this nice room here, and I'm, I don't know, two meters from that wall and about three meters from that one, okay? I'm on a 2D surface, the floor, and it takes two numbers to explain where I'm standing, okay? Now, you could do it one of two ways. You can say I'm uh, so far from this, what would I say, two meters and three meters, or you could say if that's the origin over there, let's say that corner that you can't see is where I'm going to start my coordinate system, you could give me a distance from the corner and an angle from one of the walls going to polar coordinates. Well, that works here too. If I've got a number that's, that's I, I've identified in this two-dimensional space defined by imaginary and real uh, coordinate axes, I can do this. Okay? 
I can have theta, and I can have r. Okay? A, a distance from the origin and an angle from one of the axes. That works just as well. Okay? Well, how do you go from here to here? Guys, this is looking an awful lot like uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Well, the distance of that edge of this triangle, right there, is 4, and that one's 3. Um, so let's see. That'll be the radius right there is square root of 3 squared and plus 4 squared. All right. Well, that's 9 plus 16 is 25. Square root of 25 must be 5. So the radius right there is 5. That's 3, 4, 5 right triangle. You've seen those before. All right, the last thing you need there is the angle, theta. And theta is the inverse tangent of that divided by that. Or it's the inverse cosine or inverse sine, whatever you want to use. Inverse tangent's convenient. So it's 4 over 3. And that turns out, I've got to use my cheat sheet here, um, that turns out to be 0 0.927 radians or uh, 53.13 degrees. Okay? So I can also, if I wrote out z originally as 3 plus 4i, I can also write it out as 5 and 53.13 degrees. These two mean the same thing, okay? And there's one more piece to the puzzle here I want to tell you about. So far we've talked about what a real and imaginary uh, numbers are, where they came from, um, how to express it in, uh, let's see, rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates. One last thing is I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this. When people saw complex numbers uh, when mathematicians saw them in the old, old, old days, you know, Middle Ages and things, uh, Renaissance perhaps, there was a, a tendency to think that somehow they weren't, they weren't legitimate mathematical entities, or at the very least they didn't correspond to anything physical. And so it was customary to just throw away the imaginary parts of your equations as being not relevant to the physical world, not physically correct. Well, the problem with that was when they started hanging on to those and working with the square root of minus one as if it were a legitimate mathematical entity, they kept getting the right answer. Oh, all right. Well, that means if you keep getting the right answer, that's pretty strong evidence that maybe that, that square root of minus one is okay. It's okay to work with that. All right, well, if you don't believe me, try this on your calculator. Get your, get your uh, scientific calculator out and do this. Take E and raise it to the i pi power, all right? Raising a real number to a complex power, could that be legitimate? Could that be okay? You bet it's okay, all right? And that turns out to be minus one. If you take e to the i pi power, you get minus one, all right? So tune in next time, look at the next video, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how this is possible.